Okay. Tonight is the third night. We are talking on the Diga Nikaya Suttas. Huh? Now we come to Sutta number three, Ambata Sutta. It's about Ambata. Thus have I heard. Once the Lord was touring Kosala with a large number of monks, some 500, and he came to a Kosalan Brahmin village called Ichanangala, and he stayed in the dense jungle of Ichanangala. <clears throat> at that time, the Brahmin Pokrasati was living at Ukata, a populous place full of grass, timber, water, and corn, which had been given to him by King Pasnadi of Kosala as a royal gift and with royal powers. And Pokhara Sati heard say, the ascetic Gotama, son of the Sakyans, who has gone forth from the Sakyan clan, etc., is staying in the dense jungle of Ichanangala. And concerning that blessed Lord, a good report has been spread about. This blessed Lord is an Arahan, a Sama Sambuddha, perfected in knowledge and conduct, a welfarer, knower of the worlds, unequal trainer of men to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, a Buddha, a blessed Lord. He proclaims this world with its gods, maras, brahmas, the world of ascetics and brahmins with its princes and people, having come to know it by his own knowledge. He teaches a dhamma that is lovely in its beginning, lovely in its middle, and lovely in its ending, in the spirit and in the latter, and he displays the fully perfected, thoroughly purified holy life. And indeed, it is good to see such arahans. Now at that time, Pokhara Sati had a pupil, the youth Ambatta, who was a student of the Vedas, who knew the mantras, perfected in the three Vedas, a skilled expounder of the rules and rituals, the law of sounds and meanings, and fifthly, oral tradition, complete in philosophy and in the marks of a great man, admitted and accepted by his master. In the three Vedas with the words, what I know, you know, what you know, I know. And Pokrasati said to Ambata, Ambata, my son, the ascetic Gautama is staying in the dense jungle of Ichanangala. And concerning that blessed Lord, a good report has been spread about, etc. Now you go to see the ascetic Gautama and find out whether this report is correct or not, and whether the Reverend Gautama is as they say or not. In that way, we shall put the Reverend Gotama to the test. Sir, how shall I find out whether the report is true or whether the Reverend Gotama is as they say or not? According to the tradition of our mantras, Ambatta, the great man who is possessed of the 32 marks of a great man has only two courses open to him. If he lives the household life, he will become a ruler, a wheel-turning righteous monarch of the law conqueror of the four quarters, who has established the security of his realm and is possessed of the seven treasures. These are the wheel treasure, the elephant treasure, the horse treasure, the jewel treasure, the woman treasure, the householder treasure, and as seventh, the counselor treasurer. He has more than a thousand sons who are heroes of heroic stature, conquerors of the hostile army. He dwells having conquered this sea-girt land without stick or sword, by the law. But if he goes forth from the household life into homelessness, then he will become an Arahan, the Samasambuddha, one who draws back the veil from the world, and Ambatta, I am the passer on of the mantras, and you are the receiver. Stop here for a moment. So this Pokrasati uh, is one of those uh, well-known uh, Brahmins, la. Uh, well versed in the Brahmin tradition and his disciple uh, is also very learned uh, all those things that a Brahmin is supposed to learn uh, he has learned uh, that's why the teacher tells him what I know you know what you know I know uh, and lastly the, the, the last part uh, uh, this Pokrasati told Ambata, I am the passer on of the mantras and you are the receiver. In other words, I am the teacher la, and you are the pupil. La, so you go and find out whether this uh, Samana Gotama or ascetic Gotama is as uh, enlightened as they say. La, and you judge him by the 32 marks of a great man. La. This 32 marks of a great man uh, is a Brahmin tradition. La, uh, 
Very good, sir, said Ambata, Pokrasati's words, and he got up, passed by Pokrasati by his right side, got into his chariot, drawn by a mare, and accompanied by a number of young men, headed for the dense jungle of Ichanangala. He drove as far as the carriage would go, then alighted and continued on foot. At that time, a number of monks were walking up and down in the open air. Ambata approached them and said, Where is the Reverend Gautama to be found just now? We have come to see the Reverend Gautama. The monks thought, This is Ambata, a youth of good family and a pupil of the distinguished Brahmin Pokhara Sati. The Lord would not mind having a conversation with such a young man. And they said to Ambata, That is his dwelling with the door closed. Go quietly up to it. Go on to the veranda without haste, cough, and knock on the boat. The Lord will open the door to you. Ambata went up to the dwelling and on to the veranda, coughed and knocked. The Lord opened the door and Ambata went in. The young men entered, exchanged courtesies with the Lord, and sat down to one side. But Ambata walked up and down while the Lord sat there uttered some vague words of politeness, and then stood so speaking before the seated Lord. And the Lord said to Ambata, Well now, Ambata, would you behave like this if you were talking to venerable and learned Brahmins, teachers of teachers, as you do with me, walking and standing while I am sitting and uttering vague words of politeness? And he said, No, Reverend Gautama, a Brahmin should walk with a walking Brahmin, stand with a standing Brahmin, sit with a sitting Brahmin, and lie down with a Brahmin who is lying down. But as far as these shaven little ascetics, menials, black scourings from Brahma's foot, with them it is fitting to speak just as I do with the Reverend Gotama. Stop here for a moment. So you see this uh, young Brahmin uh, is very arrogant. Uh, doesn't show any respect for the Buddha, even though he has come to the Buddha's uh, kuti. Yeah? And he says uh, that uh, the Buddha is one of those shaven little ascetics, menials, black scourings from Brahma's foot. These Brahmins, uh, they believe uh, that they are born from the Brahma's head. Uh, whereas other sects, uh, the uh, Katya warrior clan, the merchant clan, the worker clan, all born from the foot of Brahma. Brahma is their god. Maha Brahma is the equivalent of God, creator of the world. And so, because they look down on other castes, they call them black scourings from Brahma's foot. In other words, other sects are black. They think they are fair. And the Buddha said, But Ambata, you came here seeking something. Whatever it was you came for, you should listen attentively to hear about it. Ambata, you have not perfected your training. Your conceit of being trained is due to nothing but inexperience. But Ambata was angry and displeased at being called untrained, and he turned on the Lord with curses and insults. Thinking, the ascetic Gotama bears me ill will, he said, Reverend Gotama, the Sakyans are fierce, rough-spoken, touchy and violent. Being of menial origin, being menials, they do not honor, respect, esteem, revere, or pay homage to Brahmins. With regard to this, it is not proper that they do not pay homage to Brahmins. This was the first time Ambata accused the Sakyans of being menials. And the Buddha said, But Ambata, what have the Sakyans done to you? <clears throat> and he said, Reverend Gotama, once I went to Kapilavatu on some business for my teacher, the Brahmin Pokhara Sati, and I came to the Sakyans meeting hall. At that, and at that time, a lot of Sakyans were sitting on high seats in their meeting hall, poking each other with their fingers, laughing and playing about together. And it seemed to me that they were just making fun of me, and no one offered me a seat. With regard to this, it is not proper that they do not pay homage to the Brahmins. This was the second time Ambatta accused the Sakyans of being menials. And the Buddha said, But Ambatta, even the quail, that little bird, can talk as she likes on her own nest. Kapilavatu is the Sakyans' home, Ambatta. They do not deserve censure for such a trifle. And Ambatta said, Reverend Gotama, there are four castes, the Katyas, Katyas or warrior clan, the Brahmins, the merchants and the artisans. 
And of these four castes, three, the Katyas, Brahm merchants and artisans are entirely subservient to the Brahmins. With regard to this, it is not proper that they should not pay homage to the Brahmins. This was the third time Ambata accused the Sakyans of being menials. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So this is only their Brahmin belief. Huh? They, they think they are the most superior caste huh? and everybody else huh, should pay homage to them. Huh? But other people don't think so. <clears throat> then the Lord thought, this young man goes too far in abusing the Sakyans. Suppose I were to ask after his clan name. So he said, Ambata, what is your clan? And Ambata answered, I am a Kanhayan, Reverend Gautama. And the Buddha said, Ambata, in former days, according to those who remember the ancestral lineage, the Sakyans were the masters, and you are descended from a slave girl of the Sakyans. For the Sakyans regard King Okaka as their ancestor. At one time, King Okaka, to whom his queen was dear and beloved, wishing to transfer the kingdom to her son, banished his elder brothers from the kingdom, Okamukha, Karandu, Hattiniya, and Sinipura. <coughs> and these, being banished, made their home on the flank of the Himalayas beside a lotus pond where there was a big grove of teak trees. And for fear of contaminating the stock, they cohabited with their own sisters. Then King Okaka asked his ministers and counsellors, where are the princes living now? And they told him. At this, King Okaka exclaimed, they are strong as teak, Saka. These princes, they are real Sakyans. And that is how the Sakyans got their well-known name. And the king was the ancestor of the Sakyans. Now King Okaka had a slave girl named Disa, who gave birth to a black child. The black thing, when it was born, exclaimed, Wash me, mother, bathe me, mother, deliver me from this dirt, and I will bring you profit. Because Ambata, just as people today use the term hobgoblin, pisacha, as a term of abuse, so in those days they said black, kanha. And they said, as soon as he was born, he spoke. He is born a kanha, a hobgoblin. That is how, in former days, the Sakyans were the masters, and you are descended from a slave girl of the Sakyans. On hearing this, the young man said, Reverend Gautama, do not humiliate Ambata too much with talk of his being descended from a slave girl. Ambata is well born, of a good family, he is very learned, he is well spoken, a scholar, well able to hold his own in this discussion with the Reverend Gautama. Then the Lord said to the young man, If you consider that Ambata is ill-born, not of a good family, unlearned, ill-spoken, no scholar, unable to hold his own in this discussion with the ascetic Gautama, then let Ambata be silent, and you conduct this discussion with me. But if you think he is able to hold his own, then you be quiet and let him discuss with me. And they said, Ambata is well born, Reverend Gautama. We will be silent. He shall continue. Stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha says, actually, uh, Ambata, you are descended from a slave girl and your ancestor was a black child. Uh, and uh, these uh, uh, friends of Ambata, they didn't believe it. So they said, they, they told the Buddha not to humiliate Ambata. And then uh, the Buddha told them, uh, if you think uh, Ambata is not able to argue with me, then you argue with me. But if you think he is able, uh, then let him argue with me and you keep quiet. Uh, I think in the Indian tradition, uh, they argue one by one, uh, one to one. Uh. Then the Lord said to Ambata, Ambata, I have a fundamental question for you, which you will not like to answer. If you don't answer or evade the issue, if you keep silent or go away, your head will split into seven pieces. What do you think, Ambata? Have you heard from old and venerable Brahmins, teachers of teachers, where the Kanhayans came from, or who was their ancestor? At this, Ambata remained silent. The Lord asked him a second time. Again, Ambata remained silent. And the Lord said, Answer me now, Ambata. This is not a time for silence. Whoever, Ambata, does not answer a fundamental question, 
put to him by a tathagata, by the third asking, has his head split into seven pieces. And at that moment, Vajira Pani, the Yaka, holding a huge iron club, flaming, ablaze and glowing, up in the sky, just above Ambata, was thinking, if this young man, Ambata, does not answer a proper question put to him by the Blessed Lord by the third time of asking, I'll split his head into seven pieces. The Lord saw Vajirapani, and so did Ambata. And at the sight, Ambata was terrified and unnerved. His hair stood on end, and he sought protection, shelter, and safety from the Lord. Crouching down close to the Lord, he said, what did the Reverend Gotama say? May the Reverend Gotama repeat what he said. And the Buddha said, What do you think, Ambata? Have you heard who was the ancestor of the Kanhayans? And he answered, Yes, I have heard it just as the Reverend Gotama said. That is where the Kanhayans came from. He was their ancestor. Hearing this, the young man made a loud noise and clamor. So Ambata is ill-born, not of a good family born of a slave girl of the Sakyans, and the Sakyans are Ambata's masters. We disparaged the, this, the ascetic Gotama, thinking he was not speaking the truth. I'll stop here for a moment. Uh. So here you see, uh, the Buddha is protected uh, by the devas, and also the devas uh, is always on hand uh, to help the Buddha, probably uh, this uh, Yaka, uh, he he, he saw that this person uh, uh, needs to be taught a lesson, uh, so he came uh, with this uh, big club, uh, waiting to uh, pound him into seven pieces. Uh. Then the Lord thought, it is too much the way these young men humiliate Ambata for being the son of a slave girl. I must get him out of this. So he said to the young men, don't disparage Ambata too much for being the son of a slave girl. That Kanha was a mighty sage. He went to the south country, learned the mantras of the Brahmins there, and then went to King Okaka and asked for his daughter, Madarupi. And King Okaka, furiously angry, exclaimed, So this fellow, the son of a slave girl, wants my daughter, and put an arrow to his bow. But he was unable either to shoot the arrow or withdraw it. Then the ministers and counsellors came to the sage Kanha and said, Spare the king, reverend sir, spare the king. And he said, The king will be safe, but he, if he loses the arrow downwards, the earth will quake as far as his kingdom extends. And they said, Reverend sir, spare the king, spare the land. And Kanha said, The king and the land will be safe. But if he loses the arrow upwards, then as far as his realm extends, the gods will not let it rain for seven years. And they said, Reverend Sir, spare the king and the land, and may the god let it rain. And he said, The king and the land will be safe, and the god will let it rain. But if the king points the arrow at the crown prince, the prince will be completely safe. Then the ministers exclaimed, Let King Okaka point the arrow at the crown prince, the prince will be perfectly safe. The king did so, and the prince was unharmed. Then King Okaka, terrified and fearful of divine punishment, gave away his daughter, Madarupi. So young men, do not disparage Ambata too much for being the son of a slave girl. That Kanha was a mighty sage. Stop here for a moment. So this Kanha, he went to learn the mantras, and the mantras are actually very powerful things. Uh, mantras are secrets uh, handed down to the Brahmins, la, probably by the Devas. La. And they, it is their secret. La. They, they, they don't want other castes to know. La. But later, because of greed, la, they sold away the secrets. La, so that a lot of the mantras are uh, now are public knowledge. La. And the Buddha said uh, that these mantras, uh, uh, you can do many things with them. La. That normally a person with psychic power uh, only can do, uh, but the mantras uh, you can do. Uh, for example, if you know a certain mantra, you can walk through the wall. Uh. Maybe that's how David Copperfield uh, walks through the wall. Uh, uh. So, so this uh, king got so angry uh, that this black fellow wants to, wants his daughter. Uh, that's, that's how he was thinking. Uh. So he, 
took his bow and arrow. He wanted to shoot this uh, Kanha to death. But this Kanha uh, um, made him uh, not able to shoot the arrow uh, or to bring it down. And then, uh, so finally, to uh, make the king uh, know how powerful he is, uh, he said the king must point the arrow at his at his son, uh, whom he loves dearly, uh, the crown prince. And so the king had no choice uh, but to do that. Uh, and But the, the prince was not harmed. Uh, and so the king got frightened, uh, so gave away the daughter to him. Uh, so the Buddha said, uh, don't uh, look down on Kanha so much. Uh, he's the ancestor, this ancestor of the Ambata, uh, for he was a mighty sage. Uh. Then the Lord said, Ambata, what do you think? Suppose a Katya youth were to wed a Brahmin maiden, and there was a son of the union. Would that son of a Katya youth and a Brahmin maiden receive a seed and water from the Brahmins? He would, Reverend Gautama. Would they allow him to eat at funeral rites, at rice offerings, at sacrifices, or as a guest? They would, Reverend Gautama. Would they teach him mantras or not? They would, Reverend Gautama. Would they keep their women covered or uncovered? Uncovered, Reverend Gautama. But would the Katya sprinkle him with the Katya consecration? No, Reverend Gautama. Why not? Because, Reverend Gautama, he is not well born on his mother's side. What do you think, Ambata? Suppose a Brahmin youth were to wed a Katya maiden, and there was a son of the union. Would that son of a Katya youth and a Brahmin maiden receive a seed and water from the Brahmins? He would, Reverend Gautama etc., etc. But would the Katya spring him with the Katya consecration? No, Reverend Gautama. Why not? Because, Reverend Gautama, he is not well born on his father's side. So, Ambata, the Katyas, through a man taking a woman or a woman taking a man, a senior to the Brahmins. What do you think, Ambata? Take the case of a Brahmin who for uh, just stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is making this Ambata see uh, that if a Brahmin and a Katya, a warrior caste, uh, were to wed, uh, then the, the, the offspring, uh, the son, uh, would be recognized totally by the Brahmins, uh, but would not be recognized, accepted uh, by the Katyas, uh, meaning uh, that the Katyas uh, uh, one notch higher, la. They, they, they only recognize a pure uh, Katya, la. but if he has Brahmin blood, na, they will not recognize him as a pure Katya. La. Whereas the Brahmins, na, uh, since they recognize uh, the, uh, the offspring na, of a, a Brahmin and a Katya, that means na, they accept na, that the Katyas na, are equal to them. La. So here the Buddha makes him see na, that actually uh, the Katyas are on, are on a higher. So just now I was saying uh, that uh, the Buddha shows Ambata that if a Brahmin and a Katya were to wed, uh, their offspring uh, is recognized by the Brahmins, but not recognized as equal uh, by the Katyas. Uh, meaning that the Katyas uh, consider themselves uh, one notch higher than the Brahmins, although the Brahmins claim uh, that they are higher. La. But the fact that they accept uh, the offspring of a Katya and a Brahmin uh, as uh, totally as a Brahmin on equal footing as a Brahmin, uh, that means uh, uh, they look up to the Katyas, the warrior caste, la, because the Katyas, uh, only the Katya, the warrior caste, uh, can become a king. Uh. Mm. Okay, to continue. Uh, what do you think, Ambata? Take the case of a Brahmin who, for some reason, has had his head shaved by the Brahmins, has been punished with a bag of ashes, and banished from the country or the city. Would he receive a seed and water from the Brahmins? No, Reverend Gautama. Would they allow him to eat as a guest? No, Reverend Gautama. Would they teach him mantras or not? They would not, Reverend Gautama. Would they keep their women covered or uncovered? Covered, Reverend Gautama. What do you think, Ambata? Take the case of a Katya who had his head, uh, who for some reason uh, has had his head shaved uh, by the Katyas, 
and banished from the country or the city. Would he receive a seed and water from the Brahmins? He would, Reverend Gautama. Uh, would they allow him to, to eat as a guest? They would, Reverend Gautama. Would they teach him mantras? They would. Uh, would they keep the women covered or uncovered? Uh, they would keep the uh, uh, uncovered, Reverend Gautama. But then Katya has so far reached the extreme of humiliation that he has been banished from the country or the city. So even if a Katya has, has suffered extreme humiliation, he is superior and the Brahmins are inferior. Uh, <coughs> stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha is using another example, uh, saying that uh, um, if a Brahmin uh, were, were to do some offense, uh, commit some offense, uh, and he is punished by it, uh, so the Brahmins after that uh, would not receive him uh, as, uh, as a Brahmin. Uh. But if a Katya, a, a warrior caste person, uh, were to commit the same offense uh, and banish uh, by the Katyas, uh, still the Brahmins would receive him, uh, uh, meaning uh, that uh, uh, the Brahmins still accept uh, that the Katyas are actually superior to them. Uh, the Buddha said, Ambata, this verse was pronounced by Brahma's Sanan Kumara, the Katyas best among those who value clan. He with knowledge and conduct is best of gods and men. This verse was rightly sung, not wrongly, rightly spoken, not wrongly, connected with profit, not unconnected. And Ambata, I too say this, the Katya's best among those who value clan. He with knowledge and conduct is best of gods and men. And then Ambata asks, But Reverend Gautama, what is this conduct and what is this knowledge? I'll stop here for a moment. Uh, so you see, uh, uh, after showing Ambata that the, the, the Katya's actually uh, are recognized as superior uh, and even the Brahma Sanan Kumara also say so la, that the Katyas is, is the best la, among the clans la. and and so uh, he cannot dispute that la. so now uh, he humbles himself uh, by asking the Buddha to explain uh, what is this conduct and knowledge la. that means uh, conduct is charana knowledge is vija la, which we uh, went through yesterday la. and the Buddha said Ambata, it is not from the standpoint of the attainment of unexcelled knowledge and conduct that reputation based on birth and clan is declared nor on this conceit which says you are worthy of me you are not worthy of me for whatever there is a giving, a taking or a giving and taking in marriage there is always this talk and this conceit but those who are enslaved by such things are far from the attainment of the unexcelled knowledge and conduct, which is attained by abandoning all such things. But Reverend Gautama, what is this conduct? What is this knowledge? And the Buddha said, Ambata, a Tathagata arises in this world, an Arahan, Samasam Buddha, endowed with wisdom and conduct, well-fairer, knower of the worlds, incomparable trainer of men to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed. He, having realized it by his own super-knowledge, proclaims this world with his devas, maras and brahmas, its princes and people. He preaches the Dhamma, which is lovely in its beginning, lovely in its, end, in its middle, lovely in its ending, with the spirit, in the spirit and in the letter, and displays the fully perfected and purified holy life. A disciple goes forth and practices the moralities, uh, guards the sense doors, etc., and attains the four jhanas. Thus, he develops conduct. Uh, all this uh, uh, is not explained here because it is already explained in the previous sutta. Uh, he attains various insights, etc., uh, etc., et and the cessation of the corruptions or asavasa. Uh, and beyond this, there is no further development of knowledge and conduct that is higher or more perfect. So here the Buddha uh, goes to those uh, uh, various stages of uh, uh, these uh, various uh, parts of this uh, charana, conduct or practice of the holy life. Uh, and then the different uh, stages of knowledge, uh, uh, vijala, uh, as we heard last night. Uh, 
But Ambatta, in the pursuit of this unexcelled attainment of knowledge and conduct, there are four parts of failure. What are they? In the first place, an ascetic or Brahmin, who has not managed to gain this unexcelled attainment, takes his carrying pole and plunges into the depths of the forest, thinking, I will live on windfalls. But in this way, he only becomes an attendant on one who has attained. This is the first path of failure. Again, an ascetic or Brahmin, being unable to live on windfalls, takes a spade and basket, thinking, I will live on tubers and roots. This is the second path of failure. Again, an ascetic or Brahmin, being unable to live on tubers and roots, makes a fire hearth at the edge of a village or small town and sits standing the flame. This is the third path of failure. Again, an ascetic or Brahmin, being unable to tend the flame, erects a house with four doors at the crossroads, thinking, whatever ascetic or Brahmin arrives from the four quarters, I will honour to the best of my strength and ability. But in this way, he only becomes an attendant on one who has attained to unexcelled knowledge and conduct. This is the fourth path of failure. What do you think, Ambatta? Do you and your teacher live in accordance with this unexcelled knowledge and conduct? No, indeed, Reverend Sir. Who are my teacher and I in comparison? We are far from it. Well then, Ambatta, could you and your teacher, being unable to gain this, Go with your carrying poles into the depths of the forest, intending to live on windfalls. No, indeed, Reverend Gautama. Well then, Ambatta, could you and your teacher, being unable to gain this, live on tubers and roots, or sit tending the flame, or erect a house, uh, erect a house and uh, uh, honour the uh, ascetics and Brahmins who arrive? La. And he said, no indeed, Reverend Gautama. And so, Ambatta, not only are you and your teacher incapable of attaining this unexcelled knowledge and conduct, but even the four paths of failure are beyond you. And yet you and your teacher, the Brahmin Pokrasati, utter these words, these shaven little ascetics, menials, black scrapings from Brahma's foot. What converse can they have with Brahmins learned in the three Vedas? Even though you can't even manage the duties of one who has failed. See, Ambatta, how your teacher has let you down. So here, the Buddha says, uh, after explaining uh, the various stages uh, of attainment of this uh, charana and vijja uh, up to uh, liberation uh, or enlightenment, uh, then he says, uh, if an ascetic or brahmin uh, cannot attain all these things, uh, then uh, uh, at least uh, he... Firstly, uh, he goes into the deep forest uh, thinking uh, he will live on whatever the wind uh, blows down uh, from the trees. Uh, in other words, the, the ripe fruits uh, that fall down, uh, he will eat those, uh, but still maintain an ascetic life in the forest. Uh. This is the, uh, uh, being unable to, to attain uh, the various stages, uh, at least he does that. Uh. And if he's unable to do that, uh, then he takes a spade and basket uh, uh, and uh, live on tubers and roots. Uh, and also, he's uh, a bit ascetic, uh, like he still stays in the forest uh, and lives on the tubers and roots. Uh. And if he cannot do that, uh, then uh, he lives at the edge of a village or small town, uh, at least uh, near a small town. Uh, he's more comfortable uh, and he sits standing the flame. Why? Because uh, this uh, Indian tradition, uh, they pray to the fire god. Uh, and they always uh, keep the, the, the flame burning. Uh, they, they never let the, the fire go out. Uh, they, they pray to, to this fire. Uh, uh, and if he can't do that, uh, then uh, he erects a house uh, uh, by the roadside uh, and gives dana, uh, makes offerings uh, to any ascetic or Brahmin, uh, uh, any uh, cultivator of the holy life. Uh, uh, he does dana so that at least he gets married. Uh, so the Buddha asked, asked uh, Ambatta, uh, Does you and, do you and your teacher attain all these uh, charana and, and vija charana, uh, the conduct and knowledges? Uh, and he said, no. Then do you do, uh, do you go into the forest uh, and live on windfalls? And they, he said, no. Or do you go into the forest and live on tubers and roots? Also, he said, no. Or do you uh, live by the edge of a village uh, and 
tend to tend the flame la. and again he said no or do you ha- erect a house la, and do dana uh, offerings uh, to ascetics and again he said no so he said uh, he said even uh, the 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 four parts of failure uh, also you cannot do uh, and yet uh, you look down uh, on ascetics uh, and call them black scrapings from brahma's foot la. uh Ambata, the Brahmin Pokrasati lives by the grace and favor of King Pasanadi of Kosala, and yet the king does not allow him to have audience face to face. When he confers with the king, it is through a curtain. Why should the king not grant audience face to face to one on whom he has bestowed a proper and blameless source of revenue? See how your teacher has let you down. I stop here again. Eh? So here, the uh, Pokrasati. Eh? He uh, is given uh, some land uh, and uh, by the king, uh, and yet, uh, whenever he wants to see the king, uh, the king will not see him face to face. Uh, he has to go behind the curtain. <laughs> so you see, this uh, uh, warrior caste, uh, they treat the the Brahmins uh, really low, and yet the the Brahmins always claim uh, that they are the superior caste. Uh. What do you think, Ambatta? Suppose King Pasanadi was sitting on the neck of an elephant or on horseback, or was standing on the chariot mat conferring with his ministers and princes about something. And suppose he were to step aside and some workman or workman's servant were to come along and stand in his place. And standing there he might say, this is what King Pasanadi of Kosala says. Would he be speaking the king's words as if he were the king's equal? No indeed, Reverend Gautama. Well then, Ambata, it is just the same thing. Those who were, as you say, the first sages of the Brahmins, the makers and expounders of the mantras, whose ancient verses are chanted, pronounced and collected by the Brahmins of today, Ataka, Vamaka, Vamadeva, Vesamita, Yamatagi, Angirasa, Bharadvaja, Vaseta, Kasapa, Bagu, whose mantras are said to be passed on to you and your teacher. Yet you do not thereby become a sage, or one practice in the way of a sage. Such a thing is not possible. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So you see the Buddha, uh, because he knows the past, uh, he can see the past so clearly. Uh, he can tell this Brahmin uh, exactly who their former teachers were, uh, those who handed down the mantras. Uh, but he says, uh, just because uh, you receive the mantras from these sages, uh, don't think that you are a sage. Uh, just like the, the worker, uh, he stands in the king's chair uh, and speaks, speaks like the king, uh, but he is not the king. Uh. What do you think, Ambatta? What have you heard said by the Brahmins who are venerable, aged, the teachers of teachers? Those first sages, Ataka, etc., did they enjoy themselves well bathed, perfumed, their hair and beards trimmed, adorned with garlands and wreaths, dressed in white clothes? indulging in the pleasures of the five senses and addicted to them as you and your teacher do now. No, Reverend Gautama. Or did they eat special fine rice with the black spots removed, with various soups and curries as you and your teacher do now? No, Reverend Gautama. Or did they amuse themselves with women dressed up in flounces and furbelows as you and your teacher do now? No, Reverend Gautama. Or did they ride around in chariots drawn by mares with braided tails that they urged on with long goat sticks? No, Reverend Gautama. Or did they have themselves guarded in fortified towns with palisades and barricades by men with long swords? No, Reverend Gautama. So, Ambata, neither you nor your teacher are a sage or one trained in the way of a sage. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So, here the Buddha says, uh, uh, you claim uh, you are masters of the three Vedas. Uh, uh, you claim uh, you are equal to those sages uh, and look down on other ascetics. Uh, but did the sages of old uh, practice as you do now? Uh, did they enjoy luxurious living uh, like you do now? Uh, uh, all these things are mentioned here. Uh, and he said no. Uh, because in the uh, olden days, uh, those Brahmins uh, were really ascetics, uh, renunciants. Uh, they lived in the forest, they begged for their food and all that. Uh, they don't have wives or slaves uh, to amuse them. Uh, mm. And now, as for your doubts and perplexities concerning me, we will clarify these by your asking me and by my answering your questions. Then descending from his lodging, the Lord started to walk up and down 
and Ambata did likewise. And as he walked along with the Lord, Ambata looked out for the 32 marks of a great man on the Lord's body, and he could see all of them except for two. He was in doubt and perplexity about two of these marks. He could not make up his mind or be certain about the sheathed genitals or the large tongue. And the Lord, being aware of his doubts, effected by his psychic power, that Ambata could see his sheathed genitals, and then sticking out his tongue, he reached out to lick both ears and both nostrils, and then covered the whole circle of his forehead with his tongue. Then Ambata thought, the ascetic Gotama is equipped with all the 32 marks of a great man, complete with none missing. Then he said to the Lord, Reverend Gotama, may I go now? I have much business, much to do. And the Buddha said, Ambata, do what you now, do what you now think fit. So Ambata got back into his chariot drawn by mares and departed. I stop here for a moment. So here you see after the conversation with the Buddha, now when the Buddha descended from his kuti and walked, Ambata quickly walked along with the Buddha. Because like the Buddha said, uh, Brahmins, when their teacher walked, they have to walk. When the teacher sits down, they have to sit down. Uh, formerly he was so arrogant, but now uh, he quickly uh, uh, followed the Buddha. La, and then uh, he observed the 32 marks in the Buddha. La, uh. Meanwhile, the Brahmin Pokrasati had gone outside and was sitting in his park with a large number of Brahmins, just waiting for Ambata. Then Ambata came to the park. He rode in the chariot as far as it would go, and then continued on foot to where Pokrasati was, saluted him and sat down to one side. Then Pokrasati said, Well, dear boy, did you see the Reverend Gotama? I did, sir. And what was the Reverend Gotama? And was the Reverend Gotama such as he is reported to be and not otherwise? And is he of such nature and not otherwise? And Ambata said, Sir, he is as he is reported to be, and he is of such nature and not otherwise. He is possessed of the 32 marks of a great man, all complete with none missing. But was there any conversation between you and the ascetic Gotama? There was, sir. And what was this conversation about? So Ambata told Pokrasati all that had passed between the Lord and himself. At this, Pokrasati exclaimed, well, you are a fine little scholar, a fine wise man, a fine expert in the three Vedas. Anyone going about his business like that ought, when he dies, at the breaking up of the body, to go to the downfall, to the evil path, to ruin, to hell. You have heaped insults on the Reverend Gotama, as a result of which he has brought up more and more things against us. You are a fine little scholar. You are so angry and enraged that he kicked Ambata over and started to start out at once to see the Lord. But the Brahmins said, It is far too late, sir, to go to see the ascetic Gotama today. The Reverend Pokrasati should go to see him tomorrow. Then Pokrasati, having had fine, hard, and soft food prepared in his own home, set out by the light of torches from Ukata for the jungle of Ichanangala. He went by chariot as far as possible, then continued on foot to where the Lord was. Having exchanged courtesies with the Lord, he sat down to one side. So here, uh, he was so excited uh, uh, that uh, the Buddha actually possesses all the 32 characteristics of a great man, uh, which means that uh, probably, most probably the Buddha was enlightened, uh, Samasambuddha, uh, as the uh, rumors uh, go. Uh, so he wanted immediately to go and see the Buddha, but it was already too late, already evening. So they asked him to go the next morning. So even before dawn, before the light of dawn, he had all the food prepared. As you using torches, he set out to see the Buddha. And he said, Reverend Gotama, did not our pupil Ambata come to see you? And the Buddha said, he did, Brahmin. And was there any conversation between you? There was. And what was this conversation about? Then the Lord told Pokrasati all that had passed between him and him and Ambata. At this, Pokrasati said to the Lord, Reverend Gotama, Ambata is a young fool. May the Reverend Gotama pardon him. And the Buddha said, Brahmin, may Ambata be happy.
Then Pukarasati looked out for the 32 marks of a great man on the Lord's body, and he could see all of them except for two, the chief genitals and the large tongue. But the Lord set his mind at rest about these eh, by using psychic power to show him. Eh. And Pukarasati said to the Lord, May the Reverend Gautama accept a meal from me today, together with his order of monks. And the Lord consented by silence. Seeing his acceptance, Pukarasati said to the Lord, It is time, Reverend Gautama, the meal is ready. And the Lord, having dressed in the early morning and taken his robe and bowl, went with his order or Sangha of monks to Pukarasati's residence and sat down on the prepared seat. <clears throat> Then Pokrasati personally served the Lord with choice, hard and soft food, and the young men served the monks. And when the Lord had taken his hand from the bowl, Pokrasati sat down to one side on a low stool. And as Pokrasati sat there, the Lord delivered a graduated discourse on generosity, on morality and on heaven, showing the danger, degradation and corruption of sense desires and the profit of renunciation. And when the Lord knew that Pokrasati's mind was ready, pliable, free from the hindrances, joyful and calm, then he preached a sermon on Dhamma in brief, on suffering, its origin, its cessation and the path. And just as a clean cloth from which all stains have been removed receives the dye perfectly, so in the Brahmin Pokrasati, as he sat there, there arose a pure and spotless Dhamma eye. And he knew, whatever things have an origin must come to cessation. And Pokrasati, having seen, attained, experienced and penetrated the Dhamma, having passed beyond doubt, transcended uncertainty, having gained perfect confidence in the teacher's doctrine without relying on others, said, Excellent Lord, excellent. It is as if someone were to set up what had been knocked down, or to point out the way to one who had got lost, or to bring an oil lamp into a dark place so that those with eyes could see what was there. Just so the blessed Lord has expounded the Dhamma in various ways. I go with my son, my wife, my ministers and counsellors for refuge to the Reverend Gotama, to the Dhamma and to the Sangha. May the Reverend Gotama accept me as a lay follower who has taken refuge from this day forth as long as life shall last. And whenever the Reverend Gotama visits other families or lay followers in Ukata, may he also visit the family of Pokarasati. Whatever young men or maidens are there will revere the Reverend Gotama and rise before him, will give him a seat and water, and will be glad at heart, and that will be for the welfare and happiness for a long time. Well said, Brahmin, the Buddha said. Um, that's the end of the sutta. So here, it's a very interesting sutta, huh? a bit amusing, huh? how this arrogant young Brahmin uh, was humbled huh? by the Buddha. Huh? Uh, so you see the, the last part, huh? the Buddha uh, spoke, to, uh, spoke the Dhamma to Pokarasati, huh? explaining the Four Noble Truths, huh? suffering, origin of suffering, cessation of suffering, and the Noble Eightfold Path. Huh? And just like a clean cloth uh, will soak up the dye, uh, so the Brahmin uh, understood uh, and attained the spotless Dhamma eye. Dhamma Chakku, sometimes it's called the Dhamma eye, sometimes it's called the Dhamma vision. Uh, and he understood whatever things have an origin must come to cessation. Uh, and here the, the, the words are, uh, he, having seen, attained, experienced and penetrated the Dhamma, having passed beyond doubt, transcended uncertainty having gained perfect confidence in the teacher's Dhamma. Uh, so here uh, it means uh, that uh, Pukrasati attained uh, stream entry. Uh, when uh, Pukrasati uh, attains the Dhamma vision, uh, he attains stream entry. Uh, and stream entry means having attained the first path. Uh, and after some time, uh, the path will turn to fruit. Uh, after the uh, wisdom matures, uh, so you always see in the suttas and the vinaya that people attain stream entry uh, always by listening to the Dhamma. Always by listening to the Dhamma, not by meditation. Never by meditation because the Buddha says uh, that stream entry uh, is equivalent to uh, attaining right view. And right view uh, in the suttas, uh, there's only two conditions. One is the voice of another. The second is Yoniso Manasikara, careful attention. Uh, so that being the case, uh, only somebody else teaching you the Dhamma 
can you attain the uh, right view? La? Okay, we'll stop here. And uh, uh, any questions? This uh, in India, there were four castes. La. I probably now still have. La. And uh, first is the warrior caste. Eh? In Pali, it's called the Katya. Second is the Brahmin caste. Eh? Uh, in Pali, it's called Brahmana. And uh, third eh, is the merchant class, Vesas. Eh? Uh, and the fourth eh, is the worker class, la, called Suddhas. La, uh. Now, these uh, Brahmins uh, or Brahmanas uh, originally were ascetics. La. Uh, uh, originally, they were, they were ascetics. And it was in their tradition uh, that every Brahmin uh, must renounce. La, must renounce. Uh. I think at the age of 48 or something like that, uh, having learned all that they were supposed to learn, uh, the Vedas, the mantras, etc., then they go forth. Uh. So, but later... Uh, because of greed, uh, they, uh, they serve the kings. Uh, they serve the kings as advisors, uh, chaplains, sometimes they said uh, in the suttas. Uh, and the king uh, uh, would give them uh, land, give them slaves, give them wives and all these things. Uh. So they lived, they, their lifestyle changed. Uh, so after that, uh, even though the Pali word is still Brahmana, but actually uh, because... Uh, they live like ordinary folk, lay people, eh? so they are called Brahmins. La. So the word Brahmana is nowadays eh, reserved more for a holy man. Eh? Uh, but uh, in, 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 the, in the Pali text, eh, the Brahmin caste is still called Brahmana. La. But sometimes it is used in two senses. La. One is either the Brahmin caste, and the other sense is a uh, holy man. La. So sometimes, like uh, the Buddha, will refer to the Arahants as real Brahmanas, la, real holy men. Uh, so, as uh, uh, stated here uh, on paragraph 2.9 uh, up to 2.10, uh, that nowadays uh, they enjoy themselves la, well bathed, perfumed, their hair and beard streamed, adorned with garlands and wreaths, dressed in white clothes, indulging the pleasures of the five senses and addicted to them. La, and they eat special fine rice with the black spots removed, with various soups and curries. And then they amuse themselves with women dressed up in flounces and furbelows. Uh, and then they ride around in chariots drawn by mares with braided tails. And they urge the horses on uh, with long goat sticks. La. And then they live uh, uh, guarded in fortified towns la, with palisades and barricades la, with... Um, with uh, Soldiers uh, with long swords guarding them. La. Uh, so their lifestyle is totally changed. La. No more ascetics. Mm. Yeah, so the Buddha is saying, uh, you, you are not an ascetic, not only that, you have not attained the various stages of the holy life, not only that, even the four parts of failure also you don't practice. Instead, uh, you live a luxurious life, uh, indulging in all the uh, sense pleasures. La. Uh, 
uh, these, uh, there are ten names of the Buddha uh, in the Itipiso, the Chan Itipiso, Itipiso, Bhagawa, Arahan, Samma, Sambuddha, Vija, Charana, Sampanno, Sugato, Loka, Vidu, Anuttaro, Purisa, Dhamma, Sarati, Sata, Deva, Manusa, Nang, Buddha, Bhagavati. These names uh, are not, given, not, not, not coined by the Buddha. La. They are coined by other people. La. Uh, and the Buddha says uh, that <clears throat> when he talks to people, uh, he has to use the self, I, and all that. Uh, but uh, uh, his, uh, his mind uh, is unmoving. Uh, so that if people praise him or people scold him, uh, his mind is unmoving, always uh, thus. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, in everyday conversation he has to use I and mine and all that. Mm. Yeah, it seems to be more of a Brahmin tradition. Uh, they always look for these 32 marks of a great man uh, in somebody. Uh. Then I have to attain all the psychic power to know. <laughs> <laughs> What did the Buddha know? Uh, it seems that Buddha uh, is quite familiar with the teachings of the Brahma. Oh. Does any Sutta mention that he learned this in his youth? Oh, no, 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 no. You see, the Buddha being uh, somebody who is fully enlightened uh, with all the various psychic powers, uh, when he wants to know something, uh, he has to contemplate. Uh, and then he will know lo, whatever he needs to know. Lo. So probably he, uh, he could foresee uh, that these Brahmins are going to come to argue with him. Lo. So he probably he contemplated and uh, find out all these things lo, and, and use them uh, to argue with the Brahmins. Lo. So he doesn't have to learn them when he was young. After he becomes enlightened, uh, what he needs to know, he will know. But he has to make the effort to contemplate. Lo. I'm not so sure, but uh, possibly uh, because uh, uh, he will uh, make you go down, uh, make you uh, make you suffer, uh, make you um, fall. So, end maker is like somebody who makes you go to the end, uh, to, the, to the bottom. Uh. Hmm? Great 
These seven treasures uh, are supposed to be what a universal monarch possesses. La. And a, when a person uh, is so blessed uh, that the whole world uh, wants him to be a king, uh, then he's supposed to possess all these things. Uh. I don't know whether it's, a, it's, a, it's another one of those beliefs, uh, Indian beliefs or what. La. It's not important. Mara, this, uh, if you refer to the Deva Mara, <clears throat> normally he does not come down he, because he lives on the sixth heaven uh, of the sensual desire realm. Uh, every world system has three uh, levels. Uh. The bottom is the sensual desire realm uh, where all livings uh, are, uh, have lust. Uh. All beings, uh, because they have lust, uh, sensual desire, and then you have male and female. Okay? And then above that is the form realm. To be able to be reborn in the form realm, you must have attained, must have attained jhana, one pointedness of mind. Then the highest is the formless realm. To be able to re be reborn there, you've got to have attained the formless uh, jhanas, arupa jhanas. So in the sensual desire realm, you have the three woeful planes at the bottom. Hell, and slightly better than hell is the animal realm. Slightly better than the animal realm is the ghost realm. And these are the three woeful planes of rebirth. Above that is the human realm. And above the human realm, there are six heavens. And the lowest is the heaven of the four, four great heavenly kings. And then after that, Sakadeva Raja. And ab above that is the... Yama heavens, uh, and then Tusita heavens, and Imanarati heaven, and uh, Paranimita Vasavati heaven. The fifth and the sixth heaven, uh, they are so blessed uh, that uh, whatever they want, they just have to think, and it appears uh, they, they can get what they, they want. Uh, they don't need a genie of the lamb uh, to, to, to make for them. They just wish, and everything comes into being. So. Uh, Mara is in the sixth heaven, the highest heaven of the sensual desire realm. And in that heaven, uh, the beings are beautiful. Not only beautiful, their bodies are very fine, very fine. And uh, they don't have, like us, uh, blood and excrement and urine and pus and all that in our body. They don't have. Uh, so uh, Mara is, is handsome, very handsome, and his daughters are very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and he used his daughter, actually his daughters came to tempt the Buddha, but they were not successful. Uh, so, but uh, Mara will not come and disturb you until you have attained the fourth jhana. Uh, when you have attained the fourth jhana and you are near to enlightenment, then because of his ego, his conceit, uh, he cannot stand it, then he will come and disturb you. And that's why Mara disturbed the Buddha, Mara disturbed the Arahant disciples, Mara disturbed Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ was a great meditator. But uh, Mara will not come and disturb us uh, unless we, have a, we are near to enlightenment. So don't worry about Mara. Uh, and Mara sometimes also refers to the, the kilesas, the defilements in us. So we have enough Mara inside us. Uh, we can't even fight the Mara inside us. They don't think about the external Mara. Oh, no, no, no. When uh, Jesus Christ was meditating very hard in the desert, he didn't, uh, he didn't do anything except meditate uh, for 40 days and 40 nights. So because uh, he, was in, in, he was working very hard in his meditation uh, and coming near to enlightenment, uh, so Mara could not stand it, no? so came to, to ask him to stop. No? and offered him the whole world, uh, that he could become a king of the whole world and all that, just like uh, he, he, he disturbed the Buddha the same way. No? Mm. 
So he just wants to uh, stop you from meditating la, and becoming enlightened. La. Okay, let's end for now. It's been a long day.